I'm uh, Joseph Craig with Scientific American Book Club, and I'm speaking today with Dr. Robert Hazen from the Carnegie Institution. Doctor, welcome. Thank you, Joe. So uh, I know we're here at the AAAS, and I know you're speaking about the Deep Carbon Observatory. Just tell us a little bit about it. The Deep Carbon Observatory is this incredible opportunity, the scientific program, which basically is being sponsored by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. So we now have an opportunity to study carbon. Carbon's the most important element of the periodic table. It's the element of life. It's the element energy, climate, environment, resources. So carbon plays this unparalleled role in our lives. And yet, the thing is, we're almost completely ignorant about carbon deep inside our own planet. And then there's this incredible question of deep life, the deep biosphere, microbes. Everywhere you drill a hole, every time you go down in a deep mine, you find they're microbes. They're living in rock. They're sequestered. They never see sunlight. These microbial communities can survive for millions and millions of years in an environment about which we know almost nothing. And if you integrate all of those microbes from all of Earth's crust, it looks like the biomass that's hidden from us is at least as large as everything we see at the surface. All the trees, all the elephants, all the ants, all the people, the deep biosphere is at least as large. And with this uh, possibility of a, of a deep biosphere, that obviously must have implications for possible life elsewhere in our solar system. Could you tell us about that? Uh, one of the really exciting opportunities here is because we now know that life thrives in deep zones. If life only could occur at the surface of an Earth-like planet, then in our solar system, the only place life can exist today is Earth maybe Mars early in its history when we think there were oceans, but Mars's oceans have dried up. Mm -hmm. But if life can live underground in deep, dark, hot, wet zones, then you have the possibility that there's life on Mars, there's life on the Jupiter planets, Europa, Callisto, maybe Ganymede, perhaps on Titan, the great moon of Saturn, maybe other, maybe even on some asteroids. If we do find evidence of microbial life elsewhere, would we think it would follow the same evolutionary pathways as surface life here, or do we think it could be something completely different? One of the really great questions that we're trying to explore is how deterministic is the life form we see on Earth? That is, is it inevitable? Does it follow logically from chemistry, just as you always see basalt, you always see granite? You always see certain minerals like quartz and feldspar. That's going to be true on any planet and moon because that's just the way chemistry works. Well, is life the same way? Is life just an extension of the kind of chemistry you find on planets? And how did you become interested in this topic? Did, did you study earth science and get interested in uh -huh. microbial evolution later? Or? I've, I've had a, a very long and circuitous career coming to the Deep Carbon Observatory. I began my undergraduate, undergraduate career as a geologist interested in earth sciences. I went on and specialized in mineralogy and crystallography and for a time was very narrow. But I started reading a lot. I'm a member of Scientific American Book Club, so I get all different kinds of books from all different science fields. And the more you read, the more you realize their connections, their ties. No one of these sciences is isolated, but they're all part of the same continuum. And so my work in mineralogy led me to think about, well, minerals and the origin of life, minerals and the kind of chemistry that might occur, thinking about deeper environments on Earth, thinking about other elements. And, and of course, if you think about any aspect of Earth chemistry, you come to carbon. Carbon is the central element of so many processes that are fundamental to us. So that's where the whole project arose from. Great. And uh, I imagine these are some of the topics you'll be touching on in your forthcoming book. I've got a book coming out called The Story of Earth. It looks at the entire span, the 4.5 billion year span of Earth history, which is a saga. It's, it's the most amazing story of change, constant change. For much of its history, Earth was a black planet with, with just no oxygen so that the surface was a crusty black with blue oceans covering that. And then it became gray as granite and continental masses took over. There were times when Earth was almost completely covered in ice when it was a white planet. 
And so you think about these epic changes. And if you put that in perspective, Earth today is also a changing planet. It's always been a changing planet. And for us, as a human race, it's not so much, oh, can we stop change? Or can we control it in some way? But to recognize the kinds of change that Earth has undergone in the past and maybe plan around that, because Earth is going to continue to change in the future whether we want it to or not. Well, really appreciate you speaking with us today, Dr. Hazen. My pleasure. I'm Robert Hazen. I work with the Carnegie Institution, and I love the Scientific American Book Club because it gives you in one place a wealth of terrific books in all different aspects of science and mathematics. It's a great place to go for science books.